okay, what pattern do we have here? <clears throat> with superficial and deep perivascular dermatitis pattern, right? We've got a brisk infiltrate around the superficial and the deep vessels. We also have infiltrate that goes around the adnexal structures, right? Around the pilosebaceous unit, around the eccrine coils. So we can see that pattern in a lot of things. The first thing we need to see, though, is is there any epidermal change, right? Because if, if we have this pattern alone versus this pattern with epidermal changes, it can change what's going on. Epidermis looks relatively normal here, really. No good vacuolar interface, very minimal spongiosis. There's a bit of hemorrhage in the dermis here, but I didn't see any vasculitis. And um, there is also, uh, it's, it's sometimes hard to, to see eosinophils when there's a lot of uh, erythrocyte extravasation because it makes everything look kind of like an eo from low power. And then you go closer and you're like, oh, it's not an eo, that's blood. So I, I find that I have to hunt a little closer at higher power to, to see if there are EOs when blood is present in the background, okay? When we have leaky vessels. And I did not see eosinophils. I looked for a while and didn't find EOs here. And then right here, I don't know if it will transmit well in the video, but we'll try. Right in here. We've got some bluish mucin and uh, Patrick, one of my Dermpath fellows, told me the other day that this looks like uh, this little pattern of like wispy mucin with little tiny speckles on it, that it looks like a dew on the spider webs, like, you know, spider webs on the grass that get then like morning dew on them. And, uh, but he said that that was um, our colleague, uh, Dr. Wells Chandler actually uh, had uh, told him that. And so I thought, I love those cool visual analogies and I really like that one. So I don't know if Dr. Chandler invented that or if someone else did. And, you know, like many of these things, we hear them from mentors, we modify them, and then we pass them on to our trainees. And the, it's like the circle of life in, the, in pathology teaching. But anyway, there's mucin there, right? And so mucin can be very subtle sometimes. And yeah, looking for those little speckled dots. This is as high power as I can get. I'm sorry. It's helpful. Also, <clears throat> there's a little bit of elastic fiber here. Sometimes in people with a lot of solar elastosis, it's really difficult to tell if there's mucin. So I go down and look deeper in the dermis. Don't, don't look up right under the epidermis. Come down deeper and see if you can find mucin. And also, one last thing while we're talking about mucin, ignore mucin around the eccrine coils. You're going to find mucin around, not in this case, but many times you will see mucin around eccrine coils, okay? And it doesn't seem to mean anything. Sometimes, especially like in the distal extremities, I feel like I see lots of mucin around the eccrine coils, like near the hands and feet. I assume it's a, some sort of a reactive phenomenon, but I see it very commonly and it doesn't seem to have any significance uh, to my knowledge. All right, so what do we do with this? No epidermal Lupus. change, superficial and deep, and periadnexal, and mucin. So what's, uh, what's a good diagnosis here? And no EOs. Yeah, I think this is tumid lupus, and this was like a, would be a plaque like on the chest um, of a, a young or middle-aged um, female adult, right? It's like that'd be like the classic uh, story, okay? Um, I think this case was like from the you know the shoulder or somewhere. So in any case, that is uh, tumid lupus. I think fits very nicely. And as you guys know, tumid lupus oftentimes is just localized and not is is usually not associated with systemic lupus. Um, although if I start seeing interface change up here, then I start thinking about like regular lupus erythematosus. Clinical of tumid lupus is kind of distinct in that it tends to be one or a few plaques like on the chest. And there are some other entities that you guys have probably heard of like REM, uh, reticular erythematous mucinosis, which is I think of as kind of like tumid lupus with more abundant mucin. But I, I feel personally like it's probably on a spectrum, although I'm not an expert on this. And I'm sure there are some people who disagree. You know, there's lumpers and splitters in derm path. And then also um, Jessner's. It's like basically a kind of more abundant, lymphoid-rich um, thing that I think is on the spectrum with tubid lupus personally. And it can be so so much inflammation that it can mimic a lymphoma. So that's those are two things to think of that I feel like exist in this spectrum. And in this case, even though I didn't see vasculitis, there does seem to be like some vascular damage. Like the vessels are leaking. The endothelial cells look a little swollen. So I wonder if we have kind of a lymphocytic vasculitis going on here, which is kind of a bit of a controversial topic. But sometimes when we have dense lymphocyte infiltrate around vessels without neutrophils, we do see blood leaking out of the vessels and maybe some fibrin. And in connective tissue diseases, um, you can have some vascular damage and even can have like actual leukocytoclastic vasculitis in some cases. So 
So I thought that probably we do have some leaking of the vessels in this particular case here. And uh, if, if you would have shown me this and not told me the history and then put some eosinophils in it, I think this would be great for an arthropod bite reaction too. In fact, at low power, when I first put this down, I was like, oh, maybe this would be a bug bite because bug bites will often get some hemorrhage with them. Uh, but then I didn't find any eos. And then once I saw the clinical and the mucin, I thought, oh no, I think this is good for tumid lupus instead. But I, in arthropod bite reactions, I often see periodnexal, particularly around the eccrine coils in arthropod bite. All right, so there's tumid lupus. And then 